Group, so. Come in as they can. I'd like to welcome everyone today. For those of you that are physically present, glad you could make it. And to those that are tuning in on Zoom, we're glad that you're with us today. Also, as we launch with our first of our semester long weekly, Wednesday weekly ENFP seminars, uh, we have uh, in the lineup a couple of students, three students that are sort of towards the end of the semester. But between now and then, we have a number of guest speakers. And uh, today we're very happy to have with us Jennifer Molnax. Uh, Jennifer did her undergraduate studies at Clemson University, and then she did her master's and doctoral work at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. She continued on there for a few years doing a postdoc before she came to the University of Maryland. And initially she was working as an instructor uh, in the ENSP program. And then I think around 2017 uh, that she came into our department as a uh, assistant professor. And she it's been interesting to see the things that she and her students have been working on. Uh, she works on birds and she works on bears and she works on things like mice and deer and the disease carrying uh, parasites that uh, uh, in, are involved with them. Probably maybe some of you have seen some of the presentations or students have done. Um, but as I understand it, it's all related to sort of population dynamics. She does a lot of spatial analysis, how things move, what are barriers, what are the drivers. And uh, some of it has some very uh, important, I think, implications on things like Lyme's disease. If you're an outdoor person, which probably most of you are, you're concerned about Lyme's. Anyway, uh, we're going to hear about this today, and I wrote down, well, you can get the title right here. We're going to see spatial wildlife ecology from disease dynamics to decision support frameworks and merge. Appreciate you. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Today, thanks. Okay, we're going to, uh, we're doing a drive-by of everything from my lab, basically. I'm very grateful to Marty for letting me come in and give a refresher. I did give a talk last semester on a very specific project. Um, the Florida project, I'll just barely touch on that today, but really the guise of this talk is more like, what do I actually do? What does that mean? And the place I wanted to start with is what does the term spatial ecology mean? How many of you would consider yourself spatial ecologists? Raise your hand. So I see three people. Um, interest, oh, maybe? Andy's like, maybe, maybe a little bit. Um, interestingly, if you say the term spatial ecology, I like this graphic from Fletcher and Fortin from 2019 because I think it really embodies everything that that term can mean. I consider myself a wildlife spatial ecologist. And because of that, the type of science and research I do, the intersections are in these kind of three areas. I'm personally interested, like what really motivates me is understanding how animals move on a landscape. And that's coupled in my lab with some epidemiology and some disease dynamics, um, some patterns across communities and um, some structuring of communities. And, but I think that a lot of people don't think about spatial data and, and what, space, what makes spatial data unique. And so I thought I'd spend just the first two or three minutes of this talk, kind of pointing that out. Um, I'm actually teaching a class where I've gone through a lot of this, so it's been refreshed in my mind in terms of how much we don't often talk about this. When you, when you say that you're a spatial ecologist or you work with spatial data, what that means is it's not only the value of the data, but it's the location of the data, the interrelatedness of the locations of data, the distance between locations, all of that is inherently important in your analysis. And this is just a graphic. So this is from Python. Python is actually the number one programming language for spatial data analysis. Uh, I, I learned it long time ago in my master's and would happily never have to deal with it again, but it is a big driver. And you can see that there's all kinds of analyses that are considered spatial data analysis methods. But when you move from just general spatial data and now you add an animal component into it, it kind of messes a lot of stuff up. You're already dealing with space in general, but what do you think when you're dealing with an animal in the space they use, what makes that more wickedly complicated? Anybody have an idea? It is changing all the time. Anything else? 
when you when you're dealing with animals and the way they use space you're dealing with that first like the geographer's first law tobler's law you have you read this have you ever heard of this everything is related to everything else but near things are more related than distance things so given that what's the problem with animal data in particular They are, and they're also inherently spatially autocorrelated. And autocorrelation, anytime you're gonna do anything statistically is a problem, spatial autocorrelation is a special kind of problem. And so the statistics that somebody who's doing spatial ecology, especially with wild animals does, has to take that into pretty heavy account in terms of how they're gonna do it. And you're gonna see a lot of that in some of the things I'm gonna talk about, okay? So spatial data analysis is a little bit unique and some things that we don't have to deal with in say like a bench lab setting. So my lab in particular, there's kind of three big categories of analyses that I tend to see my students doing and I'm attracted to doing and I go after in terms of proposals. Looking at animal distributions on many different levels, looking at animal movements, um, and there's def many different types of analyses there and then looking at resource use. And I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of that. So. What you're seeing here is an animation of, I don't remember, like 30 plus waterfowl species across the US by week across the annual year linked with a prevalence of avian influenza. Uh, so this is a multi-step project. We'll talk about it in a few minutes in more detail, but this is based solely in distribution data tied to a disease, right? So this is animal distribution data tied to a disease. Movement patterns, some of you may remember this um, animation from Patrick Roden Reynolds thesis. This is deer movement in and around urban and suburban settings. And a lot of people hear me say animal movement, but they don't really know what that translates to in terms of math. And so I thought it might be helpful to actually talk about what is the math behind this, right? When I'm talking about looking at an animal's movement data, I'm not only looking at where the animal is standing, but between points, I'm looking at how far they go and then the angle they turn. This is a typical step selection function model, right? And from that, I can figure out the decisions that they're making, right? I'm going to very much anthropomorphize that. And they're making a decision. And I'm relating that to the things that are happening in the environment. So a paper I published right before I took on the tenure track position was looking at step selection of bears in the state of Louisiana. And you can see we have a distribution of the step lengths and the turning angles. And we were able to relate that to some very specific metrics on the landscape. This was important for this species because they'd come off the um, endangered species list. They were threatened status, they'd been delisted. And the state wanted to create very specific recommendations for very simple things that most people wouldn't think about like windrows, in ag fields, how wide should they be? What species should they be? Those kinds of things the state wanted to know. And so we used a very large GPS data set to start to understand how bears made decisions on the landscape, right? So this is step selection function. Another version of movement is, um, and I'm not gonna talk very much about this because you've already seen the full Florida project, but on the next slide, we'll see the actual resource selection, but, but the, the project that I'm proceeding with with Florida, in fact, we had a meeting yesterday, is looking at taking a base habitat map for bears in the state of Florida and creating corridors for those, which is easily done in many different ways. But what's really exciting is that we're going to actually validate the corridor development. And that's not something we see done very often in ecology. So we have a unique data set we didn't use when we built the habitat map, habitat model. And now we're gonna go back and we're gonna build corridors. We originally did this in, um, in a linkage mapper. We use linkage mapper software to do it, but we've, we've changed our minds and we're gonna go back and do an Omniscape. Omniscape's never really been used on this scale. So we're really excited about that. Um, it's, it's a pretty cutting edge because it looks across an entire surface and it doesn't uh, limit us to a size of a corridor. And then we're gonna take this independent data and we're gonna see how these dispersing bears move through the corridors that we've built. We're also gonna use road mortality data. Florida has some pretty incredible road mortality data. So we're gonna do a huge validation of a corridor process for the state. Interestingly, the state of Florida has a full on corridor, 
corridor plan for multi-species. They are actively buying real estate, um, trying to create corridors, and they plan to use this project when it's done. It's a very big one. When it's done, to use the bear as an umbrella species, you know that term, to see how well their corridor plan that they're actively following, um, it, how well this corridor model encompasses that. And then last but not least, resource use. And this comes in a lot of variations from selection to preference, lots of different methodologies. I'm not gonna talk about this. I presented on it last semester. These were two methodologies we did for habitat um, resource use in the state of Florida using a maximum entropy in the Halanobis distance. So these are kind of the general methods when I'm saying I do spatial ecology for wildlife. That's what I mean. And so I wanted to do kind of a drive by of several projects so you could see things that are actively being pursued in the lab and understand kind of some of the things that I'm really excited about and that we have coming up on the horizon. And then we'll wrap it up with a very interesting topic change that has happened kind of recently over the last couple of years and seems to be a growing um, different topic that the lab's pursuing. So. There, I've talked to you about the habitat and corridors in Florida. I'm not gonna spend time on that, but that is an ongoing project. We have a huge project that's hopefully gonna be wrapped up in the next year, looking at species diversity across the district and tying that to ecosystem services, um, both existing and potential. Uh, I have done and continue to do a lot of work on deer and mouse movements in, in suburbia. We've got several papers that are still coming out of a lot of that work. We have a new project that Madeline's starting, um, turkey distribution across an urban and rural gradient, looking at occupancy, but then specifically looking at densities within these urban parks. And the state of Maryland's very interested because rural turkeys are doing very poorly, um, having 70 to 80% loss, nest loss, yet urban areas seem inundated with wild turkeys. And so they, they're very interested in what happens with this project to try and understand why that might be. Obviously, I have a huge component of the lab that pursues Lyme disease, but it's not just Lyme, it's tick-borne diseases. I have a new collaboration with SUNY. There's a professor there who tests for a suite of 13 different um, bacterial and viral diseases, um, including Powassan, which a lot of people are interested in, and we have numbers continue to increase. It has a 10% fatality rate. And so there's a lot of work happening in this um, realm in terms of tick-borne diseases, but Lyme is always kind of that linchpin um, base. And then one that I'll talk a lot about today is uh, my waterfowl work, which I haven't spent a lot of time talking about. I've had ongoing waterfowl work with USGS and USDA since 2017, and it just has continually built upon itself. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about some of that today. Um, and when it started, it started with the distribution work and it, it's now culminated in looking at the interface of wild waterfowl and domestic poultry, um, which obviously the Ag School is very interested in. And now the outbreak of high path avian influenza, which we've seen people die from in China. Uh, and we've had our first outbreak at the end of 2021. Okay, so with a little bit more detail, um, but still barring in mind that I'm gonna cover a lot of information. Let me tell you a little bit about this uh, species diversity work in um, the district. Uh, this is Annette Spivey's PhD work. She's in her, we hope, last year. Um, she's done some pretty awesome work uh, with the district. I've had a relationship with them since I evaluated their SWAP plan as a mammal expert in I think 2013, 14. Um, and they didn't have anybody to really analyze their data. And I said, I will analyze your data. You know, we, you don't have to give us money if you just give us the data. They have 457 documented species in the district. Um, the dots that you see here are their different survey points that they've kept up with for approximately about the last 20 to 30 years, not consistently, um, not uniformly, which has caused a lot of problems and they're making a lot of corrections, but they didn't have a lot of guidance. So we sat down and redesigned surveys moving forward for them. But when you're looking at things like species diversity, you can get away with uh, having some things that are not necessarily uniform. So from this data, we did a lot of math and, and we created and identified hot spots of species diversity. And then what you can see in green where those are. And then we did 
um, some least cost path analyses looking at if you had to connect these through the matrix, where would you do it um, in terms of um, quality habitat for um, terrestrial species. Uh, she's working on some hill numbers and species diversity, a uh, rarefaction, um, extrapolation numbers, looking at which species do we have enough data that they read and reach an acetope and we can legitimately say we can speak to the species that occur in a particular area. And she's the next step beyond that is this is a, um, a Sankey graph. And basically she's looking at uh, the plan that DC has for the next decade to develop land. So they have this plan. Um, we know where we have habitat. We know what their plan is for the next 10 years. How does that fit in? Are, are they gonna potentially restore it? Or is it gonna be conserved? Is it slotted for development? A lot of it is permitted, but it's not actually actively being used, but it could be if somebody chose to. Uh, the next step in her dissertation is tying this to ecosystem services. She's using a couple of different programs, but specifically looking at carbon storage um, and stormwater um, management in particular. That's the one DC is most interested in. But looking at things like, you know, what do urban trees do in the, some of these very small systems? So it's some pretty interesting work um, that Annette is doing and we're really excited about. In terms of tick-borne disease, so notice that I've, I've broadened it from Lyme because we're gonna be testing for a lot more than Lyme. We went through this project in Howard County that many of you've heard about before for five years. Um, that was from like two, the end of 2016 through about 21. And it, uh, it was a huge project. I was pulled on kind of towards the end of the design because they didn't have a wildlife person, but they were gonna trap deer and mice. And so I didn't have nearly as much control over the study design, which is always frustrating. Uh, and we learned a lot from it. We learned a tremendous amount from Howard County. We've got papers that are still coming out from it and how Lyme disease works in those suburban settings. And we very quickly figured out that deer just really live in neighborhoods. Like this is not, they venture into them every now and then. This is nonstop, they live there. But what we also figured out is there's all kinds of other things happening in these small urban and suburban parks, like shady stuff when it comes to wildlife and ticks, right? They're, they're there, people are sick, um, and you just don't really understand the setup. Some places have very high species diversity and lots of ticks. Some places have very low species diversity and no ticks. Some places have tons of ticks and low prevalence. Other places have very few ticks, but they're all disease. And so figuring that out, is incredibly complex. And these urban spaces are different. They're just not the same as the rural spaces. And, and not just urban, um, urban and suburban, right? There's this just kind of a new, a unique matrix when it comes to tick-borne diseases. So they, they figured this out. This is from Belgium in 2019, and they started documenting some of these really weird patterns. And we'd seen some of the same stuff in Howard County. So we approached Montgomery County, who has even more prevalence of Lyme, um, and were very interested in the work that we'd done in Howard. And they were like, yes, please come, you know, do whatever you want to do, figure some stuff out for us. And so that's what we've been doing. Grace is doing her PhD, Carson's doing his master's, Madeline's turkey work is there. But we've approached it very differently than the Howard County stuff. We're, we're setting it up for a structural equation modeling experiment. And that's because this system is super complex, right? So you've got um, what's happening in your site in terms of species composition for wild animals? Which of those are hosts? Are there predator prey dynamics there? You know, what is the actual host availability to ticks? And then in the tick realm, you've got what's your soil like? What kind of soil? What's the soil moisture? What kind of vegetation cover do you have? What's the canopy cover? Then you've got these hard body ticks that have a three stage life cycle. So you've got three years you have to factor in for one tick. Right, um, and they bite different things at different times. They're they're they hatch with no disease, and then they've got these two opportunities they can pick it up. Then you've got animals moving ticks into areas to lay more eggs. So it's incredibly complex to try and understand this system in the guise of tick density and prevalence or infection rate. Is why we said okay, we're going to try a structural equation modeling 
system, but they're really finicky. I can't remember the word Cody uses wonky. I think that's like his professional term wiggly or wonky. Um, and that's just because they're hard to do. So we have a fallback of like regular linear mixed models for these systems, but we really want to try and set it up and gather enough data to be able to do the structure equation modeling. So what have we done thus far? We've identified our parks. We put in a bunch of cameras and a, a, a network. We figured out what species are where. We went into the two most urban parks and we put a lot more cameras out. So upwards of 25 to 40 cameras, depending on where you are, because that's what it takes to um, do a random encounter model where you can estimate density without having marked individuals, right? So we have cameras and the cameras are an array such that we can estimate density for most terrestrial mammals, not the small guys, but most of the others. And we're also collecting ticks within these same camera arrays. Um, and recording density. So, so most people who collect ticks don't do this. They like collect ticks. They don't keep track of where they were when they collected them beyond like general study area. And we're going out and collecting every 15 yards or meters. We're bagging the ticks. We're GPSing. And so we've got these increments of where is the distribution of ticks. We'll know the density of animals. We'll know the prevalence of the small mammals. Because inside of that, Carson's trapping every kind of small mammal he can get his hands on. He's pulling ticks off of them. So we have free questing ticks that are free roaming. And we have the ticks off of the animals he's capturing. We're testing all those ticks for a host of diseases. So we're building this community of all these pieces of information to try and better understand and quantify what's happening in this disease paradigm. It's pretty exciting work. And they've got many years to go. <laughs> Okay, um, so last big project that I'll talk about before we shift topics is avian influenza. And I was just, I was not really a bird person. Like that was not my thing. I did like bears and elk. And so the bird world, I mean, I hunted ducks, but I don't think that counts. And so this was a new thing for me, but I had collaborated on a big Chesapeake Bay project with USGS. And then they were like, hey, are you interested in doing some of this modeling? And I was like, sure. You know, it was distribution modeling at that point. I was like, we can do this. And so I started hiring some postdocs and I was like, send them on their way to do their thing. And it's just grown legs. And it's because so many problems have cropped up around the species we were investigating and in avian influenza. So let's talk about some of these projects. So the first, well, let me give credit where credit's due. There's two primary postdocs who have driven most of this work with myself and Diane Prosser. And that is John Humphreys and Cody Kent. Dr. Cody Kent just got a job at um, Frostburg, a tenure track position. He's doing really well. He's really excited. So they're both um, have amazing careers already. Uh, we started out with distribution models. And so we got a bunch of information from USDA there's about five or six different big waterfowl data sets in terms of the sampling that they typically do. And then there's another data set, and this just for birds, that's for the species themselves. And then there's a specific influenza research database that we were able to tap into to find out prevalence of avian influenza. We're not getting into specifics of avian influenza, just generally, did they have it or not? And so it was 30. I think I said 30 earlier, didn't I say 30? So 30 species of, of waterfowl, and looking at the samples, whether they had avian influenza or not, compiling all those. And it was kind of, we're not gonna go through all this, but it was like wickedly messy uh, in terms of the modeling itself. So, you know, partial differential equations to try and model these distributions, including a space-time random effect. Um, this is just um, because there's so many different issues when you start looking at things in different spaces in time. And the monthly and eventually weekly components really um, make things kind of messy. We also had a species ID effect that we had to use um, to be able to deal with some of the, the monthly variability. What we did find was that um, we had to do some smoothing because some species didn't have as much data as others. And so we ran into some, um, some problems with um, quantity versus independence, et cetera. But this is what we ended up with. So we ended up with weekly species predictions. And you can see this is by species and this is across the weeks of the year, right? So in general terms, it's like very fancy distribution modeling. 
a right? very fancy distribution modeling because we're using data that is like generally collected by the federal government. So you got to do some um, jazz to make that really compute, right? Okay. Then we add to that, who has avian influenza, which gave us that animation you saw at the beginning of how the avian influenza moves across the continent during times of the year. And we found much of the migration made sense based on the flyways, but now we're tracking the avian influenza. So you've got this peak in fall um, around August, and then we've got this kind of weird move down into the Southern US in March. And then you've got the birds and the disease tracking back up in May and July. And we ended up using kind of that spatial component to come to some conclusions. Obviously, AI was linked to duck density. This caused tremendous drama in terms of our interpretation, right? Because you don't ever want to be the one saying wild waterfowl or what's causing avian influenza. <laughs> but there was a link. There was something that needed more investigation. And we did see this high rate of avian influenza in the northern um, U.S. states during August and November but it shifted with migration. Again, this is a red flag. We're like, okay, could they be carriers? Is that what's happening? Or are the wild waterfowl picking it up from the poultry in their normal migration? So it could have gone either way. Um, interestingly, we found that it stayed, avian influenza stayed, especially in the domestic, um, in the Mississippi Valley after the wild birds had departed which made us think, is this persistent in the soil? Is this staying in the environment? Is this an environment contaminant at this point? And so it caused a couple more research questions to pop up. Maybe the Southern hotspot is important. And in fact, there has been some work in the past that's um, done that. And some of ours supported some of that to create further investigation. Right? We had pretty good goodness of fit for these models. We ended up with some good publications um, and, and that work was really supported well by USDA and USGS. And then what happened was we started seeing some of the high path variants start to crop up. Um, some of the ones that we're typically more concerned with, uh, it's like, okay, this is a problem because these are, some of these are zoonotic and it's, many of these cross many bird species, okay? And so we started another project that gave us the data we needed to start looking at what variant this AI was. Uh, specifically, we were looking at H5 and H7. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Some of this was very similar um, in the, the methodology, just uh, different covariates and the way it was modeled in terms of uh, what the dependent variable was. But we separated this by, okay, which species commonly carry which variant? And there's really good science behind that already. And then we did the same similar kind of modeling, looking at the individual species and then the rise in the particular variant across the year. And what you'll notice is H5, if you just look with your eye and you can see the H5 tracking pretty well with most of these species, not the H7, right? And so, I mean, there are some peaks, but not necessarily as well as the, the H5 tract. And so we'd found some pretty interesting information and that translated into which species are actually present at the site. And this is actually in publication right now. So looking at the duck species diversity from the site it was taken was what that led, the road that led us down. It's not just look at each individual species, but you have to look at the community of ducks from the particular site that's there was really better dictating when you're finding H5 versus H7. Lots of modeling, lots of spatial ecology. Now we're gonna change topics for just a second. And it's a little bit of a weird topic change because going from someone doing the type of science I do to, to walk into this whole other wheelhouse was a little different. And the only reason it happened was because like when I was young, like y'all's age, and I was like glutton, I was like, I want a statistics minor and I want a conflict resolution and environmental science policy minor. That was what started it. And then Dr. Bowerman is to blame for the rest of it. So Dr. Bowerman came to me in 2017 and he was like, hey, 
don't you, aren't you familiar with open standards? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, yeah, you need to come to this big vulture thing. And I was again, not a bird person. And I was like, okay, what do you need me for? He's like, well, we need spatial ecology expertise, but we also need somebody who has at least some kind of training and facilitation and like wicked problem management. And at that point it was just open standards. Now it's called conservation standards. But I said, okay, um, I'll come. So that started at the end of 2016, really into 2017. And we just had our last meeting. So that was a white back vulture. The, the guise of the project was vultures across sub-Saharan Africa are tanking, um, like nine species, um, most are threatened or endangered, right? And this is a huge problem. So what do we do about it? How do you handle that level of an environmental problem effectively? And there's lots of different ways that we as humans try to manage these problems. Um, you'll hear them termed adaptive management, you know, it's a learning process, open standards, which is now conservation standards, and the most latest is structured decision making. All of them a little bit different. There's also the logic model from USDA. All of these are how do I make decisions in the face of massive uncertainty, right? That's what they are. And this is the typical diagram you'll see. They all look very similar to this, this iterative learning process. And in concept, I understand. In reality, these are just a complete herding of cats. Like it's very difficult to do. They're usually extremely long-term. And often you're, you're left searching for money to, to deal with some of the uncertainty. So we had meetings over a process of three to four years with a room full of vulture experts and stakeholders from across Sub-Saharan Africa, right? And brace yourself, it's okay. This is very messy, right? This is what we walked away with. This is, this is the conceptual model of um, vulture decline. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna spend like two seconds. These are our targets, what we're trying to conserve in some way. And it's broken between tree and cliff nesters. And then you've got their habitat and food. And these are their direct threats. There's a lot of verbiage and nomenclature when you do programs like this, but that's, the, these are the important ones. So it took us like four years to come to an agreement with all of these experts on this. And then we had to pick which ones we're gonna actually try and address in the process. And for each one, we had to come up with what are we gonna try and do? And when I say try and do, I don't mean change the world. I mean, what is one like linchpin, one paradigm shift we could make that might have compounding interest down the chain of events, right? That is conservation standards. So in this case, this is, um, this is unintentional poisoning of vultures. This happens a lot, right? Hunters use lead ammunition because it's cheap and effective. The vultures consume it because the hunters cut out the lead and throw the gut pile full of lead. The vultures consume it and die, right? And so we started coming up with ways that you, what are like triggers you could do creating a certification program, education. And we walked away with multiple proposals that now I'm helping um, multiple agencies in Africa, um, specifically BirdLife, pr put forth a proposal to do an ammunition exchange, right? So there's plenty of other ammunition that works really well. Copper works really well. Tungsten, they're more affordable now. They're more effective now. So what do you do? You go give it away for free. You let them try it for free, right? You get a grant and you do this and you start small. That is a way to actually make a change. But the whole way through, you've got some kind of measure of success. You've got a number to go with it. Did you reach 10%? Are you seeing a 5% change in what's being bought or preloaded versus loaded, right? And so I've followed through with this project and we've had multiple publications all about how do you do this on such a scale? And I thought, okay, well, this project's coming to an end. That's gonna be it, right? No, because the federal government had been very interested in open standards and it works really well, our conservation standards, when the human component is huge, like on the continent of Africa, you have to get buy-in from the people on the ground. In the US, we don't have to have quite as much buy-in. And so something like structured decision-making can be much more effective and straightforward and it's much more mathematical, 
Like it's all built around a mathematical model. It's a little different. And so USGS approached me and they're like, and I'm teaching structured decision-making in our ENST 487 class. And she was like, aren't you teaching SDM? And I was like, yes, I'm teaching SDM. And she's like, great, because we're about to get a bunch of money to try and figure out how to decide, how to make decisions about high path avian influenza. And so lo and behold, they approached me and we got two big grants to do this. So we're, they're out testing ducks. Um, we did, had not had it until like December of 2021. And now we're sitting here. So you've got wild um, animal detections in blue and you've got poultry detections, darker brown is worse, right? We're covered up with it. And in, in China and Europe, I'm talking thousands of birds dying at a, in a setting, one setting. And here we've got birds coming nonstop. I went to a wedding, Martha's Vineyard, there's Canada geese dead from avian influenza. And I'm calling USGS, be like, there's birds that are dead everywhere. It's insane. And not only that, it's hitting raptors um, and other birds that we are not typically used to seeing be lost, right? So they need to know what to do. So I have another postdoc, Johanna, and she's working on this and, and putting all the information together. And she's like, first look, you've got these orders and these functional groups being hit. Very different than what we would have thought to, we'd see with a typical avian influenza. A lot of species, we would have never expected to have such massive loss. And a lot of these species are already species of conservation concern. And so lo and behold, we're starting to do a structured decision-making process for black water, wildlife refuge, because they've had it, they know they're gonna have it, and the managers don't know what to do. We're doing it multi-scale. We're doing it for Blackwater. We're doing it for the state of Maryland. We're doing it for the region, the Fish and Wildlife Service region, and then we're doing it for the flyway. And so this is a whole process based on how do you make the best decision? Do you wash boots of hunters? Do you wash trucks? Do you shut down hunting in certain wildlife refuges when it happens? Do you pull nesting platforms of some of these birds we're concerned about so they're not even in the area? Like they're trying to come up with legitimate actions with some kind of recording of data to see if they're effective. That's structured decision-making. And so it's a little bit different uh, flavor in the lab, but I, I have multiple projects now that are doing that. Um, still most of it in the guise of more traditional spatial ecology, but it's also kind of exciting to see the other end of it, where people are going out and doing these actions, collecting information to see if they're effective, and then adapting if they have to. That is the Mullinax lab, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have, as long as they're not too crazy statistical, um, uh, and talk about any of the work that we're doing. Yes, sir. Uh, great presentation. Uh, I really that's great overview of a lot of great work. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering, uh, so avian influenza, these different locations that you are collecting data. Uh, are you thinking about, for example, from a uh, management point of view, providing recommendation using the data in forecasting both spatial and temporally? that what will happen, here is the next, and so on. Therefore, ahead of time, uh, uh, people, they, yeah. you know, the club mm -hmm. owners and so on, they can actually do. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I, I can actually answer it specifically. So these variants of high path are very unique in that they, we don't have modeling to show kind of how this disease spreads. When it first came out and we had the first detections in the Eastern Flyway, it started in Canada and worked its way down and it hit, it jumped and hit North Carolina. I don't know if you remember that. It's a, it kind of hit the news, it was a big deal. North Carolina, they re, USGS came back and reached out to us and said, can you give us your distribution maps for North Carolina for the low path? Because we're gonna, we're just gonna have to make some assumptions. It's probably gonna function the same. And they did, they reached out to farmers, all of that's proprietary data, of course, you know, um, but we gave them our initial maps of our low path and the potential high path uh, based on what we thought. We will be updating high path distributions based on the data as it comes in. Uh, but 
you're exactly right. And, th and that is what the agencies asked for. And so we had to sign a bunch of paperwork saying this is preliminary, but they took our preliminary information and on boots on the ground started to try and warn people. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Any other questions? Yes. Do you, so this is just sort of brainstorming because like I was interested in like thinking about the virus sort of staying in sediments or in soil. Yeah. And I was wondering, has anyone thought about or maybe you thought about like the, the birds themselves sort of transporting soil that's like loaded with the virus to, to other locations? I was just thinking like if you were to sample migratory birds, they actually carry some of the sediments like on themselves or, or the, the soil. You know, this is why we need soil scientists, Jared, because <laughs> until you <clears throat> until you said that I had I you said it and I'm like imagining a dirty duck foot <laughs> and they they really are. I mean, yeah. they, wash, they wash themselves. Right yeah, now. they do. And they're in the water. But I had never really thought about in terms of there's hopping in this migratory flight, how that might happen. It's really difficult. So we there's ongoing standardized sampling of wild waterfowl throughout the flyways. Fish and Wildlife Service and USGS coordinate, as does USDA, and does a lot of this standard sampling. It's very difficult to sample and get access to data samples on actual poultry farms. And so they have outbreaks and all of that's very proprietary. We've gotten some of it, but I don't, I don't know offhand of any papers that are talking about sediment that the bird carries right. they certainly and we have tried to incorporate covariates related to standing water water acidity all kinds of things to try and get at what might keep it living in the environment but not the transport of also, beyond the bird like sneezing yeah. on another bird yeah yeah no because i was just thinking too yeah. like it's not just when they're it's not just when they're surface but it's yeah. like they also eat sediment right? mm -hmm. like dogs yeah, and yeah. Dogs. all kinds of ways it's a it's a really interesting perspective i'll have to talk to diane about it yeah yeah cool, yeah sure any other questions oh yes andy so i think whatever looks like i mean different complex model but it looks different habitat type and sometimes you can use fields and things in ponds or wetlands and, you know is there is that in some of these models or how things are moving around yeah so um so there's multiple different sets of data, and there has certainly been a ton of modeling looking at duck habitat. Um, there are Argos data where we've tracked individual ducks. We use that for some validation metrics for some of these models. We have built in more basic habitat variables into the models themselves, but nothing super specific. Like we're not getting into the kind of wetland or you know the percent forest or things like that in some of these scales. And you just hear about some areas, you know, wetlands being important for, mm. for flyways. Mm -hmm. Those change that all of it. Yeah, well, I mean that's certainly that is true what you just said. So um, changes in wetland. And water surface and water availability will change where they go within the flyway. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how we are able to better incorporate more specific variables. The problem too, though, is at that point, it has to really be remotely sensed. Like it's not something we can go out and collect with the duck. So it has to be something we can derive from a GIS. But yeah, really good thought. Hi, yes. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. So that's a, generally um, habitat modeling, a, animal movement modeling, um, evaluating the model is always a big bone of contention, right? Because a lot of times we don't have independent data. And there's a three or four kind of common ways that you'll see it done barring independence. So if you have independent data, that's what you do. And if you don't have good quality or a large data set, you might withhold uh, an amount of your data to test against of like of individuals. So that individual wasn't included in the model to create. But then we do things like K-fold bootstrapping. So some kind of you uh, randomly select a subset of the data, you rerun the model, and then you test that. And you do it over and over and over again until you've randomly selected out. I usually try and do all of my data, but it depends on how much you have. 
So you can do a bootstrapping, you can do a coefficient of variation, um, you can do area under the curve. So there's a lot of different metrics that can help you assess the accuracy and precision, but it really depends on the type, the specific type of model that you use. Um, like if you're using presence only data modeling, those have a very unique set of tests. Uh, and this is all like, it, it's interesting because it's one of the few types of data of science where you'll go into the paper and they've done like five different things. And it's because there is no perfect test of the model. You know, you're like slowly figuring it out. And the newest thing right now, the two big things are power analysis, a priori if possible, and then a sensitivity analysis. So we're seeing more weight, just as much weight, put on the sensitivity analysis of the variables that went into your model and individuals within your model as we are um, the explanatory power of the model itself. So it's kind of a big answer to that. <laughs> um, but we can also talk more about it after the seminar. Any other questions? Yes. I have kind of a more personal question. Um, aside from my research with small mammals or Lyme disease, do you have like a favorite that maybe you're most passionate about or most excited about or like what people ask you about, you're like, oh, I'll like, you know, kind of go off on more of a tangent for it. <laughs> aside from mine being obvious. Yeah, yeah, yours is, the, <laughs> yours is the obvious one. I do, I mean, yours in that, the, the linking it to the camera stuff, I find I'm really excited about that because I'm excited to see the multiple trophic levels like the food web all in one community. I think that's really exciting. I also think Joe um, Hannah's stuff and at Penn State. So I didn't even talk about that. I have a we have a mange project um, in, in Pennsylvania. That's kind of exciting because it's we've never treated wildlife and, and modeled their movements before and after a treatment. And so that will be very unique. Um, we also have like biometrics on the individual, like cortisol from scat, um, blood metrics, things like that. So looking at um, you know, these animals that are really dying of mange, like they have severe cases of mange versus animals that have like a moderate to no case. Um, comparing those will be very unique. I don't know, I'm, I'm not like excited about mange. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I'll, but they're not my favorite animal. I wish I could work on river otter because that would be, that would make me the most happy. So I don't know. Um, I think, uh, I really enjoy the research, but I have so much that it's more fun for me to watch you enjoy the research. I think that's really kind of where I am now, career-wise. Did you have a better question? I guess I was thinking about you know the One Health idea. Yeah, really definitely. Link to that, but the link between the wild, the waterfowl, and then the the chickens. You know, that's kind of a thing where there's like wild and. No, you know, this is all one health. It's all one health. And it's sort of tied in with it is. all of these things. It's interesting to think about it. Yeah, it is all one health. And now with high path, it's human health as well. Yeah. So um, it definitely all fits within that paradigm. I want from now on, I'm going to say chickens instead of domestic poultry because I like that. But <laughs> there, I mean, that's huge money. Poultry uh, well, I know me either. Me either. That's why I like chicken. Um, it's a, uh, it's a huge, I mean, financial sector it's massive. And so, I, I mean, I'm not going to speak to the ethics of how all that works, but when you have AI hit a flock of chickens and you're literally dealing with hundreds of thousands of carcasses that then you have to deal with, like they can't just leave them, you know, um, they have to create unique decomp like comp piles and all kinds of stuff. It's pretty insane. So I agree very much one health. Yes, Marty. Follow up on that. It, um, obviously there's this huge economic tie in to the uh, influenza. So, you know, we're just coming off a okay. significant human impact event. Should we, how, how concerned should we be? Very concerned. Like animals and people living together is not good in terms of wild animals, right? Um, so I, I, if you look at the people who do the real epidemiology, they called COVID a long time ago. They're like, this is just a matter of time before something like this happens, especially in markets that, you know, are dealing with animals that are closer to us genetically. Um, if, if, are, do we need to be all dire straits? No, but do we need to be more thoughtful about how it happens and people pay attention to animals in and around High density human populations, yeah, definitely. Um, and I, you know, that's why we got the investment into the high path avian influenza was coming off of COVID. 
that was a, an impetus from the federal government to be like, okay, we're going to have to invest some more money in researching these kinds of diseases that have this big zoonotic component. Good point. Any other question? Oh, oh, oh wait, one more. Oh, yes. I just thought, like, I was wondering about those photos you shared at the beginning that are kind of like these visceral photos of these, like starving animal or dead ducks. And, yeah. Like, <laughs> Like, yeah. Can you talk about those a little bit? So um, the ducks were dead from avian influenza kill uh, because they just they you just find them laying there dead. And then the deer was just covered in ticks. And then the bear was one of the mange bears from Pennsylvania. Okay. So those are all from project these projects. Um, they are kind of visceral. But that that is what those three were. Yeah. Okay. All right. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you for it.